everybody. <laughs> I love that intro. That's the shit, man. Gets me fucking juiced. Oh, I'm yeah. Evan Britton. It's great to be here. Another episode of the Mindful Warrior podcast. We're in Jed's studio. We've got Gandalf. I'm here with my brother, as always, Nate Jackson. Nate, how are you, man? I'm good, man. How are you? I'm doing pretty damn good. Yeah, it's uh, November 2nd here in Los Angeles. It's actually raining today, which is uh, very rare for this area. It's nice. Yeah, people don't know how to drive, really, when it, it rains. It gets gray. Like, yeah. But yeah. LA, LA needs a good cry. People it are does. not Hell really yeah, honest with does. their emotions here. I, think, I feel like when it's sunny every single day, you never have an excuse to be sad and yeah. stay indoors. And I think it's good for LA when this happens. Um, amen. Today, yeah, amen. Fuck. Today, uh, we have a, a special guest, very special to me. Um He's a friend of mine, been a friend for about 10 years now. Um, I'll give you his pro- professional credentials first. He is an author, a journalist, a frequent contributor to All Things Considered on NPR. I don't know if you do that anymore, Stefan, mm. but a uh, former staff writer for the Wall Street Journal, written uh, three books, and he's the current co-host of a sports podcast similar to ours uh, called Hang Up and Listen, all the way from Washington, D.C., my friend Stefan Fatsis. How are you, Steph? Hey, Nate. Hey, Evan. What's going on, guys? Hey, Stefan. Great to have you here, man. Not much, man. Great to I have you. I gotta say, I live in Washington where it's oppressive and dank <laughs> six months of the year. And now, kind of oppressive and dank 12 months of the year. So, yeah. You know. Is that because of the political climate or because of the weather? I think it's a combination of climate change and the political climate, but mostly the political climate. Okay. Yeah. I, I bet it's just really gnarly over there right now. Yeah. But we, I want to get into that a little later, but. Yeah. To start off, I, I want to get into I want to get into you, Stefan, because uh, this show is about athletes interviewing typically other athletes, but we want to interview other professionals that are tangentially related to uh, our old professions. And you are the first journalist, sports journalist we've had on. And uh, I've always been fascinated with the other side of the coin as far as sports goes. You know how the story is told. And so when I played in the NFL, I felt a certain way about sports and about what I was doing. And then when I was on the other side trying to write about it, well, I had to become familiar with this whole other side of it. You know, how do you tell the story? How do you submit a, a, a piece that's going to get written or, or published? How do you d- deal with the editorial process? How do you communicate your ideas to professionals who have a certain idea in mind of what it should look like? But you're a sports fan. You always have been, I, I assume. You grew up in Pelham, New York. Is that correct? That is correct. But I got to stop you, Nate, because I'm a little offended <laughs> that you're calling me just a sports writer? You're not just a we sports writer. We met, dude. When we met, I was wearing a Denver Broncos uniform. That's true. Let's be clear there. Well, that's that's why I wanted to backtrack and talk about you as an athlete before the journalism thing came <laughs> came in. Because you're right. You were wearing uh, – uh, and what number were you, by the I way? I was number nine. He was number nine. And when we nice. met, he was a kicker for the Denver Broncos for a summer. Yeah, he was writing a book. At the time, it didn't have a title, uh, but he was embedding himself uh, in an NFL team and went through the entire training camp with us in the locker room. He had his own locker. He was in the showers. You know, he was looking around in the showers like, what did I get myself into? What was that process <laughs> like, Stefan, to even get in there? How, how... Into the showers? Flops <laughs> <laughs> and a towel? No, just... <laughs> No, to get get that opportunity, did you were you inspired by George Plimpton's Paper Lion? Were you like how did you who'd you call, who'd you call up? All right, so we're gonna skip ahead. Well, to no, I want to get to that. I want I want to. Sure. All right, I'm just we'll fascinated work up to that. how you get to that. We're gonna get up I, to that. Level. I, I, we'll get there. I want to start with you uh, and your uh, and your love of sports. Did you yeah. put, you're a soccer player. You're a soccer guy. Yeah, lifelong. I mean, right. look, I played Little League Baseball, and there was no rec soccer in my town, but I played soccer in, in for eighth grade through 12th grade for my high school teams. Um, I played varsity ice hockey. I played golf, Nate. I was on the golf team in high school. Wow. And I was like any kid. I was uh, undersized and overly enthusiastic, and I tried really hard, and my competitive career – ended pretty much when high school ended um you know other than playing indoor soccer in new york and playing beer softball on the weekends <laughs> i stopped being an athlete when the spring golf season ended my senior year of high school right 
And were you writing at that time? I mean, were you, did you write for your school newspaper? Were you writing about sports? Yeah, I knew that I wanted to do this since I was about 15 or 16. I wrote for my high school paper. I did an internship at a, like at a local radio station when I was in high school. They let me on the air. I was 17, 18 years old, and I got to cover something called the Empire State Games, which is like, you know, the state Olympics. Um, and then when I got to college, the first thing I did on my, basically my first day was go to the student newspaper and stayed there for the next four years. So I always knew that this was what was what I wanted to do. So I was kind of lucky that way. I kind of had identified a career and I knew this was what I was going to do. I was a total sports nut as a kid. I mean, I was a huge baseball card collector, stat geek, um, fan of every New York team. Well, the right New York teams, you know, the Yankees, the Giants, the Knicks, the Rangers, um, And well, when I got to college, I really didn't want to cover sports. So I never mm. had this, this burning desire to be a beat guy. Right. Um, and I don't know whether that was some sort of like intuitive understanding that on some level, what beat reporters do is insubstantial, that there was this big wall between the reporter and the athlete, or whether it was just like, look, my interests were in harder news and I thought sports was somehow not as – compelling or substantive. And I wanted to be sort of, I wanted to cover wars and earthquakes. Um, but I'm the choice I made was not to go work for the, the sports staff in college was to go work on the news staff. And my first jobs were, were as a news reporter. I, I, I had summer jobs at newspapers. My first full-time job was in Athens, Greece. I got on a plane, bought a one-way ticket and went to Greece and got hired as a local hire for the Associated Press. Um, did cover did cover some earthquakes and terrorist attacks um, and came back and covered, you know, business. I covered Wall Street for a few years. I covered the technology business for a little while. And then I did a series of stories about minor league baseball and about the uh, about this. This was in the early 90s, mid 90s, about this labor and contractual fight between major and minor league baseball. And I did a series on sort of the business of baseball. And I ran across this independent minor league in the Midwest called the Northern League. I thought it was really cool. I was kind of sick of working for the AP. I did a book proposal and I got paid like 7,500 bucks to write a a book about this independent minor league. And from then on, I realized like, hey, you know, I remembered that I really liked sports and I was finding a way to write about it in a way that was divorced from who won and who lost. So that's what was that's sort of what drove me to cover sports like this realization like you don't have to be the guy in the locker room cranking out the game story in order to cover sports in a real way mm. right and that was 1995 when you published wild and outside yes and so uh, up until that point you were working for the AP and you're doing non sports stories how long did that go on when did you fly to Athens and how long were you writing these kind of you know general pieces before you got into the sports world It was about 10 years um, Mm -hmm. of doing non-sports stuff, all that bouncing around. I worked in a bunch of AP bureaus, including Greece, obviously. Um, And after I did this book, I had to quit the AP to do the book. And I got hired by the Wall Street Journal. And at that point, I knew that this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to write about sports and the sports business. Um, And so for the first six months I was in the journal, I did some other stuff because they already had a couple people doing sports and didn't have room. But then they were starting up a, a weekly sports page And I got to work on that. And then I ended up getting a beat covering the sports business. And that's how I got into the NFL, too. It was I ended up covering the industry and that meant covering every major league, the business of of them covering advertising, sponsorships, labor, um, you know, pretty much anything I wanted to. It was pretty wide open because there were like two of us covering all of sports at the journal at the time. Um, And so I got to know a lot of uh, owners and people at the players associations and team management. Um, so I was pretty well sourced inside the sports business. Um, and one of the people that I got to know was the owner of the Broncos, Pat Bolin, who was the head of the NFL's television committee at the time. And I covered a lot of these big television deals in the, in the 90s. Um, Nothing and- like what they are now, too. I mean, these television deals now are amazing. Oh, they were, you know, in context, they were amazing then. I mean, this is now 20 years ago almost, but in context, they were still enormous for the television business and for the sports business. Um, They have obviously extrapolated and and grown even more crazy since then. 
But this was, you know, it was clear then that this was going to be the lifeblood of the NFL going forward. Television. Television, you mean? Yeah. Uh. It was already. Right. Um, But, you know, you got to remember that free agency was only about, you know, was less than 10 years old in the Mm. NFL, like full free agency. Um, The sort of the explosion in the revenue side of the business occurred in the 1980s. And Jerry Jones was responsible for a lot of that, um, getting better marketing deals, getting more greater national deals, finding ways for teams to preserve their own revenue streams, but at the same time, um, creating bigger and broader ways of creating shared revenue streams for all the owners. Um, so it was really a, a really interesting time in the sports industry. Um, and I was, you know, I loved covering it. Are you saying that the value of these NFL teams uh, rose most predominantly in the 80s and the 90s? Or, I mean, I feel like, of course, it's probably biased because this is the time when I was involved with it. But the NFL in the aughts and up until like 2010, 2011 seemed as if it was this rocket ship that was taking off. I, I imagine it's... Rocket ship, I mean, the explosion started earlier than that, Nate. I mean, it really mm. was, you know, Jones pushing hard. Um, to make the NFL a more sophisticated marketing organization. I mean, I, when I was covering the league in the late 90s and early aughts, um, the, the, and this applied to other sports too, but particularly the NFL, I mean, the value and the scope of the deals that they were cutting with businesses was growing enormously. Mm-hmm. And the feeling inside the league offices was that, you know, that this was the way to not only um, – increase the the annual revenue of the league um, exponentially, but to create value for these franchises. You know, franchise values have been climbing since the 80s. Right. Um, you know, and, and, and yeah, you're right. I mean, the huge explosion, late 90s, 2000s, um, and the, the difficulty of getting into the league, it becoming much more of a billionaire's club. Um, that's all a, a product of the last 15 to 20 years. And so, and so it's not surprising that eventually there is going to be some kind of dip, right? You can't just keep right. going and going and going. And so the falling ratings we're seeing right now, I, I mean, that's just a natural process, right? I mean, everyone's trying to tie down exactly why that's happening. And yeah, I was, it's sort of like trying to try to explain why the stock market went up or down every day. Right. You know, there's often no real good explanation, but people are paid to come up with, to theorize and draw conclusions. Um, you know, the NFL also does tremendous, you know, huge levels of marketing, like any business, you know, they are doing focus groups and they are doing surveys, all this shit that we don't see to try to analyze what's going right and what's going wrong in their businesses. Um, that's not to say that we should necessarily believe, um, the conclusions that people draw about why ratings go up or ratings go down, because in a lot of ways there are multiple factors that are hard to pin down. Yeah, I I read this Wall Street Journal report. You know, there's been a lot of uh, kerfuffle about um, the national anthem protest pushing away red state uh, viewers. But I I read this thing that uh, that um, the blue state um, viewership is down 10 percent, whereas red state is down 8.7 percent. So so it's actually hard to say exactly what's causing all this. It could be, you know, advancements of technology, streaming. I don't think these young I don't think millennials watch a lot of football. No, I mean, and I think that the NFL is at risk and we can talk about this a little bit if you guys want, but I think yeah. the NFL is at risk. I mean, the confluence of um, the the perception of the sport changing, that the inherent danger and violence um, are less appealing than they used to be. I mean, nobody's making jacked up videos anymore, right? NFL films isn't making the greatest hits of the right. of the 2010s, right. um, so there's that overall perception. Obviously, the the improved science and better understanding of brain injuries is off putting to a lot of people. I mean, I watch the game differently. I know you guys watch the game differently. Even yeah, though I don't you even watch it. it. Yeah. yeah. Um, or if you watch it at all, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and then these externalities. I mean, I think what's a blip is is something like the 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 national anthem business, right? Um, you know, that's a blip. I mean, I think people out there that are, are legitimately are trying to argue that that fans are walking away by the millions because <laughs> right, they're turned right. off by a few guys taking a knee. That seems like complete horseshit to me. 
Yeah, it just seems like a the anti protest is another meme. It's another kind of you know. Right. I I saw these Facebook posts of like a, a lifelong Steelers fan, you know, wa- yeah. taking his jersey uh-huh. out to the backyard and putting it in a fire Burning pit. It. Yeah, and saying you know he can't stand for this anymore, yeah. and he lights it on fire. And I imagine the next week he's like going to the store to buy himself a new a new jersey. <laughs> he's like, damn it, I wish I would have done that. Even though it got thirty million Facebook views, but. Yeah. Um, I actually believe that style of play might have something to do with the reason why uh, football is not as popular anymore. Mm-hmm. I, I believe it's gotten much too predictable. Um, you kind of know exactly what it's going to look like. You know exactly the actors. You know exactly. And, and I think, I mean, we've talked about this before. It's changing offensive strategy or whatever. Mm-hmm. But Teddy, you, you might know this as a smart guy. 1905, Tez, Teddy Roosevelt convenes mm-hmm. a summit at the White House to try to save the sport because uh, it was facing a lot of blowback. 19 players had died on field uh, that year. And so he got these guys um, uh, uh, to the White House, and they came up with some rule changes. They uh, allowed the forward pass. They created a neutral zone. They doubled the first down from 5 to 10 yards, and uh, they abolished mass formations that were kind of part of the deadly nature of the game. And uh, fatalities went down, and the game survived because it was less predictable and spread out the action. Uh, I wonder if some kind of similar rule change, spreading out the action, making it less predictable, would also make it fuck the ratings would make it safer for the brain because these 300 right. these 330 pound guys like Eben used to be are standing in the same spot every play and everyone knows where they're going to be standing and so they're all smashing each other in a very predictable fashion mm. every single play the CTE studies that have come out the vast majority of CTE findings come in offensive and defensive linemen sure that's also because there are more of them than anyone else on the field but it's also because that's the that's the epicenter of the carnage, mm-hmm. and so and so how do we you know space out the action in a way to uh, to minimize the the brain damage? What if you make the field bigger? That could be interesting. Expand but the field. Would you need more players? No, keep the players the amount the same. I had an old O line coach tell talk to us about this. He was when I was training for the combine. He said you got to make the field bigger. Guys are too big and too fast. Right. Mm-hmm. And so making the field bigger, giving them more space, you know, reduce reduce injuries, reduce the trauma. You're talking about the width and the length? Yeah. Like a, a la the CFL? Sure. I wonder if they can do like comparable CFL CTE studies with NFL. That's an interesting thought. I mean, uh, I mean, I'm sure there are some scientists in Canada looking at Canadian players, and I'm sure that some Canadian brains are being donated to the Boston University uh, Research Center. I mean, the analogy there, Evan, that's interesting is you look at Olympic hockey, right? They play on a mm-hmm. bigger rink. Mm-hmm. It's a much wide, op- more wide open game. Um, uh, fighting is banned. Mm. Um, it's it's a much more offensive, artistic, right. um, faster form of the game. And I think in conjunction with other rules changes. Yeah, sure. That could help minimize or reduce slightly um, the the kinds of contact that players experience. Because really, as you guys know better than I or, or anyone else, it's the kind of contact that players experience that really is what's at issue here. It's not, you know, the one big hit in the in the in the in the defensive backfield. Right. It's not the receiver getting leveled in the chest after he. Um, catches a pass. No. Yeah. It's the play after play after play grinding contact, the sub concussive stuff. Yeah, I had a thought of making all uh, all everyone on the field is an eligible receiver. On offense. you know, this is really funny. You should mention this. I was just I stumbled across this story the other day. There's this 82 year old guy um, who has come up with this idea for changing football. It's effectively a new sport. He calls it Claremont rules football because it's <laughs> named after this town in, I think, Iowa. Um, and it basically makes everybody an eligible, an eligible receiver. It basically turns it into a game of speed and skill and not contact. So you well, can't, they, don't, like, they don't tackle? You don't, you don't hit people? They don't tackle. Right. So it's a different game. But, you know, it's finding that middle ground. Right. You know, like, like last week when um, – when was it Flacco who got who got yeah you know, Flacco got Flacco leveled yeah. got nailed yeah. yeah it's like you know, what if the NFL just said like any hit after a player is clearly down 
illegal. Is illegal. Yeah. I would dispute that he was clearly down there because Flacco didn't drop to his knee. He didn't do it in a typical sliding way. He ran as if he was trying to get the first down, and then, oh, shit, and he kind of dropped to a knee instead of dropping his whole body and sliding, and he put his head right up there for old Yeah, but, you know, and then it will require a generation of players to learn how to adjust their behavior. Yeah. How many times in a game do we see four or five guys go in for pile a kill? one after a tackle or during a tackle? Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah, Constantly, you see it right? all the time. Yeah, all, all the, the time. Because that's how we're coached it's to pack do it. Hunting. That's yeah. how you're coached to do it. Yeah, there are actually a lot of drills that you do it in practice where coach is like every defensive player has to get to the ball. Uh, yes. to the ball. Like, oh yeah, all the every time. single man. You know. Yeah, and so it's really a coaching issue more than a more than a player well, issue. On the coaching, something interesting that I in uh, I had this conversation with a he was a dude, an Australian dude who had played rugby his whole life. And we were talking about, I had just gotten into the NFL and he was saying to me, he was like, you know, it blows my mind how you guys tackle because everything is with your helmet in front of the man. Whereas in rugby, everything is coached to tackle with your head behind the man, you know, essentially saving your head, all of that, you know, force and, and, you know, potentially concussion. I mean, I thought that that blew my mind. Brain injury. Oh, issues, absolutely. Right? Absolutely. But that blew my mind. Like, the, just that simple adjustment. And why have football coaches for so long? Everything is get your hat in front. That's how you stop the man. You cut off the angle. Well, yeah, because also because your hat, your helmet is the most effective weapon you have out there. And if I'm 220 pounds and I'm trying to take down or block this guy who's 270 pounds, my best chance is to smack him with my helmet like right under his chin. Yeah, right in the face. And the coaches preach that, man. Put a hat on him. Yeah. Right? right. Light him up. Actually, but wasn't a couple years ago Pete Carroll yeah, brought he, in some rugby he's coach? Doing, yeah, well, that's what he does now. And they call it like, I don't know. Hawk tackling or some shit like that. But that's what he coaches in Seattle. But I think, Stephen, you'll know this. I think they probably studied um, the effectiveness of the heads up tackling program and found that it didn't have any discernible difference in, uh, well, in no, injuries. And, and as you've, uh, you and I have talked about, you know, there's instinct involved more than anything mm. in, in football. Yeah. yeah. You know, you're not thinking in that split second that, all right, now it's time for me to position my shoulders to the right and move my head slightly out of the direct line of contact with my opponent. Right. You know, you're going in there to kick the shit out of him. You're yeah. going to get him down. Right. Yeah. And it's the ang- it's those angles. It's those angles that are taught. It's the technique that is taught in, in, in how to pursue those angles and how to block and how, I mean, you sat in those meetings. Yes. Um, so let's get into a little bit of that, the, you sitting in those meetings and go back to, to Eben's question about uh, how did you get that gig and, and what made you come up with it and then how did you go about securing that gig to, to write a book about life inside the NFL? Mm. Um, Eben was exactly right. George Plimpton was my influence. I mean, I had read Paper Lion when I was a kid. And I mean, literally, I was sitting at my desk at the journal one day thinking, you know, I got to do another book. It's been five years since my last book, which was about the world of competitive Scrabble, a book called Word Freak. Nash, uh, um, New York Times bestseller, by the way. Thank nice. You, thank you. Yeah, it, Word Freak. Um, and, uh, and I really wanted to do another book. And I was getting kind of, you know, not bored exactly, but I was getting kind of, you know, you're in a job for a long enough time. We all experience it. Um, I was ready to do something different, take another couple of years off and try to do something different. And literally sitting at my desk one day, I just thought I should do a modern paper lion. It's genius. And my second thought was, well, I can't fucking play quarterback. <laughs> so I'm right. and I'm five foot seven and three quarters. <laughs> um, so what could I plausibly do? And the only thing, and then I started to think about really the only thing that someone like me, and I was 42 at the time, I'm an okay athlete, coordinated, you know, I still was playing sports until I blew out both of my knees playing soccer. <laughs> um, but I can... You know, I played soccer from the time I was 12 until I was uh, 38. Hmm. Um, so I knew that the one thing that I could do and that I could that would get me inside and I could do credibly would be to kick. I never kicked a football or at least not since screwing around on the high school field, you know, at soccer practice. Hmm. Um, but I knew this was something that was plausible and that if I brought this idea to people that in the NFL that would would have to approve it, 
this would at least be a reasonable pitch. Right. It wouldn't be like, I want to play quarterback the way Plimpton did, because that would be ludicrous. Mm. Um, so e- I have even it would even be ludicrous for Plimpton to do it now because of the specialty. Yeah. When Plimpton did it. Right. But yeah. Plimpton, you know, Plimpton did it much more as the clown. He was the sort mm. of a feat Brahmin right. intellectual playing this game, this sport. Right. <laughs> he also right. had a way of relating to athletes. Hmm. That 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 I don't think people would that, that athletes would relate to today. Right. Like I'm trying to imagine like this 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 guy like Plimpton strolling into a locker room today, and it seems less likely that he would get the access <laughs> and the trust of players that that he was able to in in 1963 when the book came out, or 61 when he went to Lions Camp. Hmm. Um, so I had this idea, and I knew you know because I'd been covering the NFL for the Journal, right. I was friendly with people in the commissioner's office. And I had contacts at most teams. And so I basically started cold emailing or cold calling um, the PR guys and the, you know, other people in the league that I knew um, to see if they would buy into this idea. Um, And I started locally. I started with, you know, the Redskins and the the Ravens. Um, The Ravens, I came close. Uh, cause they were, they were sort of a progressive open organization that liked the idea of reporters being around. Um, they had just let John Feinstein in to do a book, mm. um, the previous year and that didn't help my cause. So they ended up declining. Mm. And then, you know, I went to the NFL's league office and I asked them and they said, you can do it if you can get a team, which was really important. Mm. Um, and then I just kept calling teams. I met with the jets. I talked to the Redskins. Um, I talked to, you know, like it was team after team after team. Just a and lot of no's. What what were their responses? It was like twenty no's, Evan. It was twenty no's. Were they afraid of having the element of you in infecting like the locker room and? Yeah, totally. they were afraid I mean, of you. They were afraid of their players starting to use their brains, think, yeah, thinking about things. That, that would be part of it. Yeah, but I think it, it's more that that paranoia and that that control that NFL teams and other sports teams hmm. um, want to uh, exert over their employees. Yeah, uh, the hmm. reporter is still you know reporters are really important to the game. Yeah, are yeah, the NFL's publicists um, with the, the good and the bad. Right, um, absolutely. But at the same time. There is that wall hmm. that teams want to maintain. You don't let someone inside your business wh- who might, you know, you're afraid might reveal something. Yeah. And whether that is something nefarious or something innocuous, most organizations are really reluctant to let outsiders in. In this case, I just called Pat Bolin directly. And Bolin said to me when he called me back, and I sort of laid out this pitch like, hey, Pat, all right, here's my idea. I want to do a modern paper lion. You know, he knew who George Plimpton was, obviously. Yeah. Um, I would do it as a kicker, and I'd want to be there for all of training camp. And there was a pause on the end of the line, and then Bowen <laughs> said, huh, I thought you were calling me about the TV deal. <laughs> <laughs> and then he I said, no, oh, man, I, this is what I want to do. And he said, I kind of like that idea. Let me talk to Shanahan. Mike Shanahan was the coach of the Broncos at the time. And the reason I didn't call the Broncos sooner, Nate, you know, this was because Shanahan was perceived as a control freak, right? Someone who was terrible with the media, who talks in canned coach speak <laughs> and, and is not someone that's willing to let outsiders in for right. a second. Right. So I said, you know, I just didn't even bother, but I knew Bolin really well. He was a really good source of mine. So I finally, it was like, I got to, you know, I haven't tried these guys yet. Let me call, let me call Mr. Bolin up. Nice. And then about about a month later, Bolin calls me back and says, I talked to Mike. He's willing to do it. Wow. Nice. Get your ass out here and be ready to kick. (laughs) Literally. And we made a plan. Like, okay, I'm going to go to the first mini camp in June. Uh, (laughs) Holy shit. And I had been, like, because I'm I'm a good reporter, I had spent the previous, like, I had been, I basically spent the previous six or nine months getting into shape. Like uh, anticipating that someone was going to say yes. Someone's going to sign me. The assumption yeah. that I would get a team to buy in and let me do this. If I didn't get a team to buy in, well, fuck, I'd be in great shape. You're so, in great shape. Okay. Um, so I had spent like, I had a personal trainer. I gained about, you know, a dozen pounds. Mm. I was eating six meals a day. I was doing two a days. Nice. I, 
found a kicking coach in right here, right uh, in Virginia, near where I live, a guy that had uh, that, that taught not only high school kids, but guys that were in the NFL. Um, and that was a total stroke of luck because he was awesome, a guy named Paul Woodside. Nice. Um, so I was ready. So when yeah. Bowling get their ass out here in June and it was April, it, at that point I was like, all right, I'm taking my leave of absence from the journal immediately. Um, and I'm going to, you know, spend the next three months working out like a demon and kicking more and more and more so that when I got out there, I would be, I would at least appear to be credible. Nice. And Nate, you know this because I knew that if I walked into the locker room and I was just some dick and I was <laughs> unathletic and I yeah. thought everyone would yeah. you know, open up to me just because I happened to be there, that that wasn't going to happen. Right. Yeah. My attitude from the very first moment was I had to get you guys to trust me. Yeah. And the first step to getting you to trust me was to make you see that I was sincere. I wasn't going to be kicking 60 yarders, but at least right. you would know that I was sincere, that I was trying. And yeah. so somewhere deep down, I know you were going there to write a book, but somewhere deep down, were you thinking that, hey, maybe there's a chance here that maybe I'll you know, make this Jason run, Elam but... pulls a hammy <laughs> in the last preseason game. They see that I've been aces under 40 yards, yeah. and they bring me in for the first three weeks to kick extra points? No. No. <laughs> Delusion that Did, that was going to happen. No, no, I was not that crazy. Well, um, well, you were very serious about your craft they, when you were there. Nate, did they introduce? Yeah, did yeah. They introduce you. We did, we did. Um, so the first day, I don't know. Maybe I'll, I'll give you my perspective of yeah. the first time. What was it I like? saw you? Well, we were out in the uh, we were out in the uh, going out to stretch basically before practice, right. and mm. and I had seen this this fella here, and I uh, thought, well, yeah, he's he's a kicker. Uh, obviously, but everyone was kind of joking. Hey, it's uh, Martin Gramatica's dad <laughs> over there. Yeah. Already going I was yeah. Yeah, he was 42, oh, 43 nice. years old at the time. And, you know, around a bunch of 25 year olds, a 43 year old man is like yeah. someone's oh, yeah. dad. Uh, I'm 38 now, by the way, Stefan. Yeah, it's pretty exciting. I'm We're all 30. growing up. But uh, we had this thing, and I don't know at what point this moment happened, Steph, uh, but we had this thing where a rookie would get called up to the front of the line to break us down during stretches and do a little dance. You know what I mean? And it was always intended to embarrass the rookie, to have him come up, do something off the wall, and everyone, oh, you know, gives you a big round of applause. The goofier, the more ridiculous, the better. There really is no right answer there. The only wrong answer is to do nothing. And uh, at right. some point uh they called you up there and um you you tried man i remember exactly <laughs> what you did you did this little like if you dropped down like he kind of squatted down and did this little like macarena thing and then he like yeah. jumped up in the air like full spread eagle and like with, with yeah. wide eyes like one of those maori warriors like no. ah! <laughs> and everyone just like screamed it everybody was, it was, was into great. it yeah and it was great i mean yeah and, and and I and as I walked, and this is like the intro to the very. This is like page one of the book. I use this scene as the beginning of the book. Like when I got back to the back of the line with the other kickers, one of them, this guy Tyler Fredrickson, who didn't make the team. Um, you know, Tyler said, "You're in," because I had I had done what I was supposed to do. I looked right. silly, and I was a good sport. And these guys now had a way to relate to me. So that was the best thing that could have happened to me. Nate was for me to be called out in front of everybody on day one. Absolutely. Yeah. Because then we were comfortable seeing you in the locker room, seeing you in the showers. And like you were saying, that separation between athletes and beat reporters, your whole intent for doing this was to break that down and see actually what was really going on, see what these human beings are really about inside this system. And you think it, you were able to do that? Um, well, that was my intent from the beginning. You know, my spiel to everybody in the locker room was that I'm here not because I care about who's going to start at quarterback, you know, or whether you guys are going to make the playoffs this year. I'm here because I really want to understand what it's like to play in the NFL today. Mm -hmm. I want you guys, I want to talk to you about what it feels like, what it's like emotionally, what it's like physically, what it's like mentally on a day-to-day -day basis. I want to understand the relationships that you have. I want to understand what you like about this job and what you hate about this job. And by the way, I'm not going to write a word for two years. Right. Mm. So it's not going to show up in the, you know, the Denver Post on Sunday. 
Mm. Um, I am here to write a full, honest book about what it's like for you. Um, you know, not about the marketing, not about the business, not about whether Mike Shanahan should be in the Hall of Fame, not about the Super Bowl. It's about you, human beings. Right. I know for me, when I finally did get out of the NFL, there was a lot of things that I didn't realize about myself until I was done and how that world affected me and what I really thought about it. And I imagine, you know, for guys who were being interviewed by you, it was a similar thing. It was like you were you were not forcing them, but you were putting them in a position to explain what they had never even tried to yet. And they didn't even really know whether yeah. what they felt, you know, how am I reacting to this system? Like, what is it doing to my personal life? What is it doing to my heart? What do I really think? Because we were so programmed to give those, those answers that you're just describing about, you know, the system, about the offense, about our chances and blah, blah, mm-hmm. blah, 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 that uh, did you find any difficulty there getting guys to really even be able to articulate what they were going through? You know, the funny thing, Nate, I think is that I think athletes are looking for an opportunity to talk about what it really feels like and what it really means to them. Um, Because you guys know that stuff gets tired answering questions about, you know, do you think you're going to make the team or how's your hamstring? Right. Um, You know, it's you want to be treated like a thoughtful, sentient human being whose existence extends beyond the field. Um, and what surprised me, or maybe surprise is the wrong word, because I like to think that, and you can answer this, Nate, I like to think that the players did come to trust me. I always felt like I was sort of half mascot and half, you know, stenographer, like, or therapist, mm. um, that the players that I asked to talk to me Nobody ever said no. Yeah. And I knew not to ask like the offensive line because they've spent the whole summer giving me shit. Um, (laughs) We had an offense. There was an offensive line policy in Denver where nobody spoke to the media. That was part of their deal. You could not talk to the media. And if you did, even if, even though Eben was a second round draft pick for the Jags in 2009 and we had, you know, first round, second round picks and the media would want to talk to those guys and they'd have to say, no, I I can't, (laughs) I'm not allowed to. And if they did, then they'd be punished by their O line, by their old guys. The O line is very, it's sacred, man. And very tribe. It's a tribe within the tribe. Big time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. big time. Our old line was just the grimiest group of dudes yeah, who were it's so a fun. Whole, it's a whole sector. It's a they department. Were. But I think, you know, in the end, I think they liked me too. You know, I think they liked having me around. I don't think they were offended by my presence. I think they were just play acting yeah. the yeah. role of the offensive line. Absolutely. That's what it was for me. I think the only time where uh, you would run into any trouble in there is when you were actually holding the pen and the pad. In the locker room. And you're like, you know, like, I want to know, you know, what's going on. So you, I think you probably figured this out pretty early that you just should probably just leave that in your locker and then remember Mm. whatever you wanted to write down and then go write it down. Which I did from time to time. But then it was also, it got to be my shtick too. You know, my (laughs) my notebook was in my helmet as I would run out onto the field. Right. Um, And guys would see me stop and take notes during (laughs) practice. I mean, I remember one time one of the offensive linemen had just gotten bloodied in um, a drill and, you know, he, he, and I'm like writing shit down. He looks up at me and he says, are you, are you writing down what I'm saying? He's like, yeah. That's not what you're saying. What the fuck do you think I'm doing? <laughs> That's awesome. Well, it was so commonplace to him. And just to see someone who was actually kind of interested in that part of it was right. probably shocking. Well, and I think that that's what, you know, and that to me was, Nate, was what was so rewarding about it was like seeing guys who I'm mean, giving them an opportunity to talk about something different, but also their willingness to do it. You know, whether we were talking about race or head injuries and, you know, head injuries, this was 2006 when I was in camp and it was only really starting to be a big topic of conversation yeah. in the media. We didn't know about uh, CTE then. Yeah. No, yeah. no, no, no. And I remember the one offensive lineman who would talk to me um, arrived late in camp. It was Adam Meadows, who yeah. had been in the Colts for you know more than a decade protecting Peyton Manning. And he had quit the Colts, retired, given back the signing bonus wow. that uh. he received on his new deal and, and said, thank you, but I can't accept this because I'm done. 
and then took a year off and then had surgery, shoulder surgery, and came back. And Adam was the one guy that didn't care. Adam was like you, Nate. He was you know, thoughtful and smart and understood what I was doing and was curious about it and wanted to participate in it. And he was a guy, you know, that was one of the most vivid memories that I have from, from those interviews that summer, asking him, like, are you worried? Like, simple question. Are you worried about your future? And he said, yeah, I'm worried. I mean, my wife and I can't even talk about it. I'm so scared about what will happen. Um, mm. So getting the players to that spot you know, on the one hand, yeah, there's probably a willingness and a desire for them to do it. On the other hand, I was kind of like really proud of myself, you know, for being a, a good enough person and then a good enough reporter that you guys were able to trust me. Yeah, and and I think a lot of the tension that you see these days between reporters and athletes or between teams and the media is because not enough reporters take that approach and actually do want to get to know these guys or at least give them the benefit of the doubt. And it's always, you know, if you make a bad play in the game, we're going to be at your locker right after the game asking you why you didn't make that play. And right. guys, there's, I mean, they'll write you off for that. They will never open up if, if they think you're just going to kick them when they're down. Um, well, the fact that this perception existed of Coach Shanahan, and you know, you can get into if you want your feelings of dealing with him directly, but he was responsible for assembling the team that you found yourself around, <laughs> and all those men who did open up yes. to you. It, it seems as if Coach Shanahan has these multiple sides to him, where yes. he, he was able to bring in these guys who were soulful guys, kind guys, you know, multi-dimensional guys, where he himself might not have been comfortable talking about this these things. He was attracted to people who did. Yeah, he was. And I give him a lot of credit for being a great reader of of players. Um, and my one on one conversations with, with him were, were actually really good. Um, you know, again, him understanding that I was writing something that wouldn't be published for two years made a difference. Right. And yeah, he focused a lot on the here and now, like, who am I going to cut? And should I, you know, should we get rid of Todd Sauerbrunn finally? You know, the, the <laughs> reckless punter. He was our, um, he was our punter who was like, is he from Long Island? Or he's like, uh, yeah, he was from Long Island. Long yeah. Island guy, you know, had been caught up with some steroid stuff in the past, you know, <laughs> shaved his whole body, liked the pain pills. He used to tell me how he liked to take Vicodin before he pulled out all his nose hairs. Wow. <laughs> So you couldn't feel it. I was writing the book, Nate. I know, Come and it, but he, I, but I love Todd Sauerbrunn. Like he's yeah. awesome. He, he's a fun locker room guy to have. But an, an yeah. example of those guys that just come into your life for those you know years while you're there, and you have this colorful experience, and then boom, mm -hmm. the bubble bursts, and then you never ever see these people again. Right. And there's right. no chance I'll ever see Todd Sauerbrunn again. You know what I mean? Like I, I don't imagine. And and that's one of the sad parts about life in the NFL is after the fact. Um, did you, did you have any of that separation anxiety when you left that in, environment and thought, Hey man, I'm, I'm probably not going to see these people again. Uh, yeah, because it was, you know, I, like how many people can say they did what I did Two, yeah. one of them's dead. <laughs> <laughs> right. Pretty um, awesome. So, I mean, I felt really attached to a lot of you guys. I mean, I felt like I established real friendships and how many of them endured? Look, I'm in touch with, you know, obviously you on a regular basis and a couple other players occasionally. Um, but you know, there's a part of me that is incredibly grateful and wistful for it because, because I know it's a cliche and we hear athletes say it on all the time, but when you leave the sport, the thing you miss the most is the camaraderie and the people. Yeah. And for me, it was like being in this weird environment, weird to me. Like I was granted this, this, this pass into this world um, that was so alien from the rest of my life and alien for almost every fan in America. Yeah. Um, and I was allowed to do this and I felt very deeply attached to that. And I still do. Yeah. And what was your feeling of the world? What was the feeling you got being in there? Um, you know, the intimidation faded really quickly. And I mm -hmm. think I sort of blended into the background. Mm -hmm. And I think like a lot of players, it's really like Stockholm syndrome. Uh. I mean, it was training. <laughs> yeah. You were there from 7 a.m. until 10 p.m. Right. And I think I started to really think like 
a player. Yeah. Um, I got bored by, you know, August 2nd um, <laughs> and was homesick and missed my kid and, um, and, and felt, you know, claustrophobic. Mm. Um, and, and felt like you're sharing this bond. And that's part of it too, right? Part of the psychological indoctrination in the NFL is that you are sort of put in this, in this environment where your senses are deprived. Mm. Your freedom yeah. is deprived. Your senses are deprived. The routine is prescribed. And yeah. that's designed very, you know, very intentionally to make you guys feel closer to one another. And it works. Totally. And before we move on from from this experience with the Denver Broncos, I'm going to set this up and I want you to finish the story for me. Now, you know, Evan, you're familiar with these times in the middle of training camp. It's at the end of a long, hot practice and Mm -hmm. coach, you know, brings the team up and he kind of creates this scenario. He's going to throw you a bone if this situation happens. Mm -hmm. Well, we were all hot. It was probably middle, I don't know, middle of training camp. And coach brings us up and says, you know what, guys? We're going to do something right now. We're going to give Stefan a chance to make, what was it, a 40-yarder? Or what was it? Oh, shit. It was like a 25-yarder. A 25-yarder. And if he makes this field goal, no meetings at all tonight. Oh, holy shit. Night, you have the night off. Yeah. Okay, so when you heard that, Stefan, what started running through your head and then take it from there? Um, well, first it was, okay, shit, I got to write down everything Shanahan just said. (laughs) (laughs) Hold on. Could you repeat that, Coach? Wait, wait, wait. I need to have a clear record of what's going on right now and what I'm thinking. So I'm like furiously scribbling notes, but I had been waiting for this moment for, you know, three weeks. Um, And I had sort of asked Shanahan very, you know, in politely, like, you know, Mike, if you would give me a chance to kick in practice, (laughs) I was trying to get the league to let me kick in a preseason game and it didn't happen. So I also knew journalistically, I'm thinking this has to happen at some point. And Mike was great because he agreed to do it at some point. He just said, okay, be ready. Um, (laughs) And I was tipped off by our special teams coordinator, Ronnie Bradford, that (laughs) today might be the day. Um, But there was no guarantee because he had said that on other days too. And it didn't happen for one reason or another. Um, And so I'm like warming up like I always do because it was a kicking day and, and I'm banging him. I mean, I'm like 35, I'm good, 38, I'm good. I'm like, I'm like kicking for me, great, consistently nice. high, strong kicks. I'm ready to go. And so Shanahan says this, I'm furiously taking notes, I'm putting my helmet on. Everybody's like, you know, encouraging me and patting me on the helmet and patting me on the ass. And then I get out there and it's like, it's supposed to be like you've done it a thousand times. That's the only way to be a successful kicker. <laughs> this is just pure muscle memory pure routine. And I got out there and I have never been more frightened in my entire life. <laughs> because now you've got a live rush. You've got I guys am, in front of you. Oh, did you? I am scared shitless. He Not had a rush on it? Live rush, well, they had a the whole you know, field goal team. Fans, yeah. you know, oh, that's right. 2,000 fans that are watching oh. practice. Yeah. <laughs> and the 90 guys that are counting on you. On me. Yeah. Um, and I basically shit the bed. Uh, I uh, duck uh, hooked the 25 yard field goal. It was like no, 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 no. I think you hit it along the ground, the first one. You no, actually. No, it, went, it went left of the goalposts. It did get over the line. Um, <laughs> uh, it was the first kick I had ever committed. Um, and Chan and so of course me- of course the entire team you know erupts and moans yeah. and uh, yeah but. Redemption, redemption. He gives you another chance. A different day. Oh, it was a different day. Wait, so yes. did you have meetings that night? Yeah, we had meetings. Yeah, oh, fuck yeah, fuck. we had. And everyone, and were you in those meetings, Stephen? No, I think I probably. You went home. Special yeah, special teams didn't have meetings. So. Yeah, no, yeah. Special teams go and play golf after. Yeah, practice. kickers, kickers get to take on a different trade while they're playing. It's crazy. Um, yeah, but so you got another chance at a different practice. Another chance of different practice, and I missed the first one that day too. And Shannon gave me a second chance of that on that day, and I made it. Yeah, and because um, don't take my word for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, well, it's it's a wonderful book. A few seconds of panic, um, and and actually after it was done, Stefan, you sent me the the manuscript to read, yep. and and I remember receiving it at my house in Denver and and opening it and sitting at my table and reading it, and um, I was blown away 
by a lot of stuff. It's a, it's an amazing book and, and really well written. And for all the, the reasons you just described, was groundbreaking to me. But it also it also kind of gave me a glimmer of what my writing career might look like and, 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 and a way to kind of actualize my own ideas and turn them into something that you could sell. And um, so the book came out two years after you were there. Mm-hmm. And how was it received by the, the sports world or even the kind of, you know, the Wall Street Journal world? I mean, I like to think it was received pretty well. I wish it had sold more copies because right. I also think it was a, a really, you know, a rare insight into what the NFL is like. And I think it stands up today. Um, I, you know, I, the league hasn't changed that much. No. Um, the way players think and behave and the way coaches players th- and think and behave hasn't changed that much. Um so, I mean, it was received well, you know, all the reviews I got were good. The one, you know, the, the reviews that mattered to me, Nate, were the reviews from you guys. Yeah. Because the pressure I felt was that I would do justice to the players' stories, that I would, um, that I had conveyed what you were experiencing. Um, and look, I couldn't have done it without you guys. Right. It was your book as much as it was my book. And, you know, I think at some point in the book, I called Nate my he was my you know NFL whisperer because Nate's not a big character in the book, um, just sort of popped in occasionally. Mm. But Nate was always like, you should think about this or why don't you talk about that or why don't you go talk to him about this? Mm. Um, and Nate would always explain what was going on, the dynamic of of what was happening during camp. Um, yeah. And to me, that was you know, it was about these friendships. And I didn't want to betray the trust that the players put in me in talking to me and letting me into their sanctum. And so did you have conversations with, with the guys after the book came out? Did they read it? Did they tell yeah. you what they felt? How did that they go? Did. Yeah. Great. I mean, to a player, yeah. I mean, everybody felt that I got it. I think that, that was one of the great, that was one of my favorite emails. It was from one of the linemen, one of the offensive linemen, but not one of the starters. So it wasn't one of the guys that wouldn't talk to me ever. <laughs> um, and he just said, you got it. Hmm. And that was the, the confirmation I needed. And I had already gotten it from you and and others that read it quickly. But when I sort of got that email, I was like, yeah, that made me feel so great. Like, like I had, I had, I had proven myself worthy of being allowed to do this. Um, and that I had been able to tell a story that really reflected reality. Well, when I was done, when I realized that I was done playing, um, I kind of started writing these these articles, these these freelance small pieces, and I would send them to Stefan and say, "What do you think? And where should I send it?" And you would tell me, "Well, this is maybe Deadspin. I think you, I, I don't know if you originally got me set up with Deadspin or if I got I think connected with them. The first one was Slate or Deadspin. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and I, you know, the first the first few I remember editing. Yeah. And then after about four or five, Evan, it was like, he doesn't need my help anymore. <laughs> he's like, yeah, he's a writer. Well, I, see cool. that. I had yeah. actually been writing that we- weekly br- uh, journal for the Broncos website for three years, uh, when I, starting when I went to NFL Europe and then carrying on for two years after that. And I learned a lot about, well, I was a company guy then, you know, I was writing right. about, I was on the Broncos and writing about how cool it was to be representing the Broncos and trying to win and, trying, and all that. And uh, so there was a whole other side of the coin that I had to figure out how to tell uh, that story. And I know that when I came out, I, I was a, I was shooting from the hip a little too much. I thought I had to like make a name for myself and you know call out people, uh, call out people who were you know misbehaving or who said something this. And um, it's <laughs> it's hard to figure out for for a, a former player trying to make it in that world how how to do it. And it, I feel like if I hadn't had you to kind of direct me, um, I wouldn't have known where to start. And I, I talk to people, athletes hit me up about writing, you know, and I tell them to try to develop their own voice, to write pieces, to send them around. But guys have not had a lot of luck with it. Um, what would you suggest for, for athletes who want to get into writing? How would they go about doing it? Well, it certainly helps to have somebody on the inside like me, Nate, right? I yeah. Mean, you know, we had a real relationship and I was able to, to put my, you know, to steer you because I trusted you and because I felt your work was good. Look, if your work had sucked, I wouldn't have said, Hey, let's try to get this on the editorial page of the New York times. Right. Um, or let's, let's try to get this onto slate. Um, 
So part of it is, look, it's the talent first, and it certainly helps to have somebody you trust, but reaching out to people is a good idea for athletes. Reaching out to people that you've come across in the course of your career, writers that, you know, whose stories you've read and and thought, oh, that's really good. I like that. Or writers whom you trusted um, with your words and were okay with the way they turned out right. in print. Um, you know, the it, it's sort of become a little cliched now because the Players' Tribune exists. And, you know, the way they do stories is different from the way you were writing pieces, Nate. Right. I mean, a lot of that is as told to, and there's an editor writer on the other end that is rewriting and shaping the well, athletes they s- words I'd, uh, they suck i mean i i've tried to work you can with tell them. that that it's not it's not their some voice of them turn out great i mean there have been some that are fantastic yeah but it's just and some you can tell are the product of sort of the grinder of someone reshaping and right. prettifying the words and so if even the authentic player's voice site is also bullshit like where can you know should we start our own thing? I mean, should we start our own website? Should we start our own uh, print? I like that print? Idea. I mean, you know, like, would you want to get involved in that? What's up, man? Uh, that's a great idea. I mean, you know, I think people perceive the Players' Tribune as being authentic. Um, you know, the advantage the Players' Tribune has is there's a lot of money. They've got money. Right. You know, they're, they got Jeets and they've got other backers to make this thing work and they have a whole staff of real journalists Hmm. um sports writers who are there you know creating these stories and coming up with ideas and 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 working with the the athletes to to make their voices sound like something yeah Um, make it sound like uh, them like make it sound like themselves i mean there is definitely a tone to the players tribune yeah Uh, i actually submitted a piece um to them and the guy came back at me with just these outrageous ideas and requests and and things he wanted to do to it and i just (laughs) i said forget it i don't even want to do it man it was it was i I felt that it was insulting i had spent a lot of time working on this thing i thought it was intelligent i thought it 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 offered a solution uh to what i stated was the problem in the front half of it and Mm -hmm. he just kind of wanted to butcher it all take the solution out of it and then you know this stuff but it's it's hard i think think that you know the, the athletes athletes like you and chris cluey made a, you know, for a while was writing a lot for Deadspin. And if you've got something to say and you've got a voice and a personality, there are more places now to yeah. get your work published than there've ever been. Yeah. And that's really cool. And that's the opportunity that I think ex-athletes need to seize because fans are, you know, the wall is broken down a lot more than it was 20 or 30 or 50 years ago, the wall yeah. between the fan and, and the athlete. Yeah. And, yeah. and I think that younger fans are way more sophisticated in understanding that these are guys or women, that these are human beings, and they're eager to hear those voices. Um, and so I think, like, if you really want to be a writer and you're an ex-athlete, you've got a lot to say. Your experience is fascinating. Right. And whether it's the experience of, you know, the holistic experience of what it felt like emotionally to be a professional athlete, or it's like the minute grain, you know, the, the small grain stuff about about the technique or about, you know, the day-to-day, that's all really interesting and relevant to people. So th- there's opportunity out there. So, so it's there, the players just have to develop a style and write and figure out how to use words because football players don't speak very often. They don't get to articulate their ideas. They don't get to object or craft an argument or come up with an alternative plan to the one that's presented to them. It's just a very, very much a yes, sir environment, which you witness. But, um, one of the reasons I want to pull you on here today was just to thank you for doing your part to kind of, you know, bridge that gap. And um, before we get out of here, um, um, what are you working on now, man? What's what's next? Is there another book in the works for Stefan Fatsis? Are you just going to uh, just sit up in that attic? Retire? And, uh, yeah. Are you are you done now? <laughs> Hell no. No, no, no. No, I'm I know you're not. Book. Yeah. What are you oh, working I'm, on? I'm Tell us about it. Yeah. Uh, well, first I want to say before I say that is that, Evan, like I'm going to say it to you because I don't want Nate to hear it. <laughs> but the, the th- I've told people this before, but the thing that has made me happiest about having done what I did is Nate turning into a real writer. Yeah. Um, Nate getting these books published and 
and getting his voice heard. Um, that brought me more satisfaction than, you know, anything that if this book had sold a hundred thousand copies, which it didn't, um, the thing that made me happiest was, you know, that I helped someone find a career and a voice. And that's really cool to me. Absolutely. Thank you, man. I can see that. And just seeing like the cosmic connection of that, uh, relationship being kindled, you know, that year in, in Denver. Absolutely. That's so cool. And that Nate is, you know, one of the only guys from that time you still keep up with and that Nate has taken the path that he has as a writer and as a, you know, really a outside the box thinker, mm-hmm. you know, and having and applying that to his athletic career. I mean, it's, it, it's fucking cool, man, to see. Well, it is fucking so, cool to see. I get it. Well, there's a lot yeah, of there's awesome. a lot of there's a lot of thinkers out there who are also athletes and have artistic yep. ambitions. The the goal is to try to f- connect those. You know, the goal is to try to facilitate them before it's too late. I was writing before I stopped playing. I was doing that. You know, journal. I wrote for my school newspaper at home. I was tinkering on a, uh, with a journal. I was practicing this thing that I would su- someday do. And that's well, what, and importantly, you were taking notes while you were playing, also a little bit. But actually, a lot yeah. of the stuff I did for the book was just go back and look at um our season and you know yeah. each game and i would look at each game and i'd be like i remember that game i remember that week i remember that guy you know i'd look at a team picture and i'd look at, and i'd see these guys and i would remember all these stories and i started to piece it together that way but yeah i i was prepared for it and so you know Evan, it's funny what you just said is also like it got me thinking that athletes need to understand that what they do is artistic right yeah, yeah i totally agree and, and I with think that. that gets squeezed out of it yeah you know, that you, gets you, beaten out of you. It gets beaten out of you. And not only in football. No, yeah, for it's sure. It's the monotony of training Discipline. for any sport. Sure, yeah. It beats the shit out of you. Yeah. Like, go read Andre Agassi's memoir mm. about how much he hated tennis. Right. I remember covering, um, I covered the, the the Athens Olympics in 2004, and I got to know a shot putter named Adam Nelson uh, pretty well. And I caught up with him after the games, and he had finished second. He finished, he got a silver, and it was the most heartbreaking end to an Olympic event. And so I went back and found him like a month after the Olympics ended to sort of see how he was doing and sort of do a follow-up column. Like, what's it like after, you know, they're not putting laurels on your head in ancient Olympia, which is where they had the shot put that at, at these Olympics. And I asked him, are you going to do this again? He was like, you know, it looks great, but it is so stultifying. It is so boring to be a professional athlete, to do what I do, that I don't know that I can commit another four years of my life to do this. I want to go to, he he was like, I want to go to business school. Like I got into Dartmouth business school. I want to go to business school. I want to have a life. He ended up competing again. Hmm. Hmm. You know, because the tug is there. Right. And you miss that. But you know, I think that athletes can lose sight of the fact of how gifted and how beautiful what they do is yeah. in like in physical space right. and also in mental space. Right. Absolutely. I think that's a great acknowledgement there. Well, Steph. Shit. I want to encourage the, uh, the listeners out there to pick up all of Steph's books. Wild and Outside. Word Freak, and of course, the book we've been talking about, A Few Seconds of Panic. Do you, Are you an active uh, social media guy? Do you want to plug any of your uh, your handles? Uh, yeah. Sure. Yeah, at tell- Stefan Fatsis is that, Twitter. That's right. S-T-E-F-A-N-F-A-T-S-I-S. Um, <laughs> and my new book you asked about, right. I'm Embedding. This is my third embedding in a row. So I embedded in the world of Scrabble, and then I embedded in the NFL. And now I'm embedding in the world of dictionaries. I've Love become it. a lexicographer. Awesome. I'm writing uh. definitions from Merriam-Webster dictionary, Merriam-Webster's dictionaries, and I'm uh, writing a book about the future of language and the dictionary in the digital age. Wow. Pretty fun. That's a that's podcast. Pretty- yeah, that's a yeah. podcast in and of itself. The future of language. Do you have a deadline? Um, yeah, more or less. I <laughs> well, I wish I had that kind of uh, leeway when it comes to uh, deadlines, which I don't. But or I'd never have, but I imagine someday maybe I will. Yeah. Stefan, thank you for joining us today on the Mindful Warrior. It's been a pleasure having you, my friend. Thank you, man. Thanks, Evan. Thanks, Nate. Talk to you guys later. We're out. Peace. Peace. 
Thanks for listening to the Mindful Warrior Podcast, brought to you by Athletes for Care, a health and wellness resource for athletes of all ages. Don't miss out on Nate's books, Slow Getting Up and Fantasy Man. Be sure to check out BringTheHurt.com, a pain advocacy platform dedicated to alternative healing practices. Visit BeTrueOrganics.com for all of your CBD needs. Use promo code BRITTON, all caps 10, for a 10% off discount.